Today on this uncharacteristically cold day for the Santa Cruz Mountains, I'm taking a look at one of the more confusing entries in the entry-level luxury sedan segment, the Cadillac CT4. This has been confounding shoppers and reviewers alike, and even some buff books seem to get comparisons for the CT4 a little bit wrong. Let me explain what's going on here. The renaming of the ATS to the CT4 and the CTS to the CT5 were the means by which Cadillac right-priced their lineup and then retargeted the competition. The ATS was focused at the BMW 3 Series and the Mercedes-Benz C-Class, but it always felt a little small on the inside, also a little bit cheesy to be honest. But the CT4 is a lot less expensive than that ATS. One model year to the other, it lost $6,000 of MSRP and Cadillac retargeted this model at the Audi A3, the Mercedes-Benz CLA and A-Class, and the BMW 2 Series Grand Coupe. Then, of course, there is this Blackwing model, which is the direct competitor to the Audi RS3 and the Mercedes-Benz CLA 45, which begs the question, is this CT4V Blackwing the best sedan I've driven in 2022, or is that still the Audi RS3? In terms of price, interior dimensions, and performance, the CT4 is the direct competitor to the A3, S3, RS3, the CLA lineup, and the BMW 2 Series lineup. But it's quite different because this, the CTS, the CT5, they all ride on the General Motors Alpha platform, which was designed to compete dynamically with the BMW 3 Series. Also, stylistically, you can see that the hood is really quite long here, even though it was not designed to accommodate an inline six engine. We just have a twin turbo V6 or turbocharged four-cylinder engines under the hood. But you'll also notice that the driver and front passenger are positioned quite far from the front of the vehicle. The headrest is actually right about here, so at least half of the vehicle is in front of the driver's heads. That's very different than we find in the front-wheel drive-based competition. That would be the BMW, the Audi, and the Mercedes again. I think that's why I love the look of the CT4. I think this is the most attractive entry in the segment. I've always loved the art and science design, even though that's not quite what Cadillac calls it anymore, but the angular design themes, this really strong accent pipe that runs across the front, full LED headlights here, and a big grill. I think it's a really handsome, well-done look. It also is more aggressive than the more simple lines that we find perhaps in the Audi or in the BMW especially. If you're confused how the CT4 could grow in length over the ATS, yet somehow be the competitor in a smaller segment, you're not alone. Let's talk about what's happening here. This is 187.6 inches long. It's about 10 inches longer than an Audi A3. But almost all of that length happens right up here in front because this is the only rear wheel drive entry in this segment. And of course the CT4V Blackwing is rear wheel drive only. No all wheel drive is available. On the inside we have legroom that is almost identical to the A3 and a cargo area that's almost the same as well. So really the only difference is this hood right here. So the recategorization makes an awful lot of sense. As you'd expect out of a sport trim, we get a few tweaks versus the regular CT4, but it's still pretty restrained back here. We get fairly simple full LED tail lights, a bit of a spoiler add-on to the top of the trunk lid that already has a bit of a bump up, and then quad exhaust tips down at the bottom. Now clearly, if you're car shopping, you can compare the CT4 against whatever you would like. Last few times that I've car shopped, I've gone in a million different directions comparing SUVs to sedans to pickup trucks to whatever. But when we're talking about in-segment comparisons, I think it's really important to understand where the CT4 lies, because this is a lot less powerful than an M3 or a C63 AMG, but it's significantly less expensive, nearly 20 grand less as far as the base price versus the last generation C63, and you know the new one is gonna be even more expensive. But compared against the BMW 2 Series Grand Coupe, the CLA, and the A3, this price tag is right in line but its engine lineup and drivetrain are very, very different. For $34,395, you get a two liter four cylinder turbo rear wheel drive. This is the only rear wheel drive entry in this segment. It's also the only entry with the V6 and the only entry with a manual transmission, but I'm getting ahead of myself. That base model produces 237 horsepower, 258 pound feet of torque, it gets an eight-speed automatic transmission and your choice of rear wheel drive or all wheel drive. We then have an optional 2.7 liter turbocharged engine. That engine starts at 47,790. It will give you either 310 horsepower or 325 horsepower and 380 pound-feet of torque if you get the CT4 V. Cadillac has gone in kind of an odd direction with the V thing. 
V used to be the top level in performance, and then there was a sport level below that. Now we have V, and then we have V Blackwing. I have no idea why. It seems weird to me. But the 2.7 liter turbo is a great engine. It produces a lot of power and it uses the 10 speed automatic transmission, which is absolutely fantastic. You can also get either of those power levels with all wheel drive. Then we have this engine here. It's the Blackwing engine, but not obviously the Blackwing that we expected to find in Cadillacs in the future. That one was limited only to the CT6, but I digress again. <laughs> $60,495 gets you this engine right in line with the RS3 and the CLA45 AMG. This engine is mated to either a six-speed manual or a 10-speed automatic transmission, but no all-wheel drive. And that is another change here because the RS3 and the CLA45 all-wheel drive only. This engine produces a lot more power though at 472 horsepower and 445 pound-feet of torque. That's 71 more horsepower than an Audi RS3, 90 more horsepower than a CLA45 AMG, and a whopping 171 more horsepower than you can get in a BMW 2 Series Grand Coupe. But this is rear wheel drive only, and it's also about 200 pounds heavier than those all wheel drive options. That combined means that this is not gonna be quite as quick as some of them, but it's gonna have a completely different personality because Rear wheel traction is definitely an issue for hard launches. To help compensate for that, we have staggered tires, 275s in the rear, 255s up front. You'll notice that rear wheel drive vehicles tend to have wider tires on average, especially in the rear. Some of that is simply platform design and some of it is because they want extra traction. Weird twist, the RS3 also has staggered tires, but it's in the opposite direction with the wider ones happening up front to compensate for the weight balance. This has a near perfect 50-50 weight balance, so they decided to put the bigger tires in the back. At just under 11 cubic feet of cargo capacity, the trunk is right in line with the CLA and the Audi A3. Again, a lot of the length increase for this versus the A3 happens with that longer hood. But some of it is also due to the design of the platform and those wide rear tires that make the cargo area a little bit narrower. Then there's the 12 volt battery on the driver's side of the trunk, and the fact that under the load floor, there's a little bit of extra room going on here that we typically don't find in the German competition, and this area does not seem to be included in that cargo figure. Jumping into the CT4 from one of the German options, you'll immediately notice the difference in driving position. The dashboard is a little bit further away, and the hood is certainly longer, so the front of the vehicle is definitely further away, and that gives you a different feel out on the road. We have a powered tilt telescopic steering column, a very comfortable driver's seat. I'm going to give this 9 out of 10 points when it comes to front seat comfort. We have a manual extending thigh cushion. They say that this has seat massage, but here's what's going on. It has a three bladder style four-way adjustable lumbar support where the three bladders inflate and deflate, and then it will very slowly change their inflation. They call that massage, but it's not quite the same as you'd find in some of the larger and more expensive luxury competition. On the other hand, we have a passenger seat with the exact same range of motion as the driver's seat, including that anti-fatigue function. Also, two position memory over there on the driver's door. And one thing that I like is that Cadillac gives us this little button to move the driver's seat further back and move the steering column further forward to help you get in and out of the vehicle a little bit more easily. And you have the choice of doing that with the button rather than simply having it do it every time so you don't crush your groceries or passengers in the rear. Jump into the back seat and you'll immediately see why it made sense for Cadillac to realign the CT4 with the subcompact competition. Again, combined legroom is more similar to the 2 Series and CLA. Rear headroom is a little bit better than CLA and 2 Series, but still not great and a little bit unusual because of the way this ceiling is shaped. Calling the shape eccentric might be a bit of an understatement. You can see this is where the sunroof goes. This does have a standard sized sunroof right there and that goes into this section of the roof. And then we have this really, really aggressive dish up here to improve headroom, but then a pretty large bump right there for the middle brake light. Technically, the CT4 has a bit more headroom than some of the competition, and indeed, sitting exactly like I am, my hair is brushing the ceiling, but my head's not touching the ceiling. I am, however, staring right at this part of the ceiling because my head is in this incredibly bowl-shaped area, and you can see that there's also this big bump right here for the center-mounted brake light. Here's what's going on. This area right here is where the sunroof would go into when it's open, and as a result, if I lean forward, my head's actually banging on this part of the ceiling. 
Although technically that does give me more room than in some of the German options. Now, if I look down here on this side, you can see that we don't have a lot of leg room. I would not be able to sit behind this front seat with it all the way back, but we do have air vents for the rear passengers and a reasonable amount of knee room if this front seat's adjusted for me at six feet tall. Like the suede fabric on the back of the front seats with the V logo embossed there, and parts quality is definitely good for the segment this competes in. A common complaint with the ATS is that its interior just wasn't competitive. Cadillac addressed that in two ways. The first way obviously was realigning this with less expensive competition, but then they also improved the quality of the interior. So lots of stitched goods going on for the front seats. Again, that suede back right there. Since this is the black wing trim, we have a little black wing logo right there on the bolsters. The bolsters are fairly aggressive and the seats are ventilated and heated. You can see we have that contrasting red piping, the red shoulder belts, etc., that extending thigh cushion over there. But the biggest change happens when we move over to the doors and the dashboard. The style is fairly familiar, but the materials are definitely more premium than the ATS. Lots of soft touch materials going on on the front doors. Of course, there are harder plastics down at the bottom of that door to help improve durability and, of course, lower costs. But that's also what we find in the Mercedes, the Audi, and the BMW, of course. Moving over to the dashboard, the style is pretty similar to before soft touch stitched materials on the upper section of the dashboard. This kind of looks like an injection molded dashboard until you get in close and you can really see those stitching lines separating those two separate pieces of material. But as you'd expect, again, harder plastics just lower than that right there, just below that little silver strip. And then of course, around the glove box, which is fairly large, I was able to fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside. On the downside, we do have a fairly small infotainment screen. This is one of the smallest in this segment, and even in this vehicle, it looks honestly kind of oddly small right here. I am surprised that Cadillac hasn't grafted a bigger screen onto this. We might see one in the future, but we also may not, because rumor mill says the CT4 and CT5 may not live that much longer because Cadillac's going all electric. We have a home button there to take us back to the native interface for that screen, engine start-stop button over here, Climate controls for the dual zone system right there, buttons for the heated and ventilated seats, Qi wireless charging mat there, joystick style shifter. I am not the biggest fan of the way this shifter looks. It is kind of, um, I don't know, a little bit cheesy for some reason to my eye, but I do love most of the components in here. A common complaint with Cadillac interiors is that some components are shared with other GM vehicles, like the turn signal stock and windshield wiper stock, etc. Honestly, I don't mind that at all. I just wish the shifter was perhaps a little bit schnazzier. We have controls down here for the infotainment system. It's also a touchscreen, so you have the choice of which controls you want to use. Drive mode button down here, auto brake hold there. We have a slot where you can store your smartphone and then access to this large center console with USB ports. As I've said before, I've always found some of the complaints about parts sharing a little bit lopsided because few people seem to complain about Audi and Volkswagen sharing bits. Over here on the driver's side, we find a full LCD instrument cluster, and it's one of my favorites. The display is highly configurable. On the right side, we have a menu where you can also adjust the things that you see over there on the left side. For instance, if we don't want to see that engine boost, instead we want to see G-Force, you can do that. But there are also a number of different layouts for this display as far as the look and theme. This is the sport mode. There's also a tour mode. The animations are really well done on this display as well, something that General Motors has always done a good job at. And then there's the track mode, which is perhaps a little bit more exciting. If you'd rather link the theme to the drive mode, you can also do that, but I kind of prefer the sport look. Let me know what you think down there in the comment section. If you're concerned about dashboard LCDs being a little bit too dazzling at night, Cadillac has an intriguing solution that I like a lot more than I had expected to. At night, if you use the dimmer switch over here and you start rotating it down, obviously both displays are gonna start dimming, but two notches before the end, the infotainment display will actually turn off. So if I zoom in real close here, you can see that this display is still there, right there with that same theme, but the infotainment display is actually off. And then if I go even one notch further than that, and zoom in here a little bit so maybe you can see better, you'll notice that the theme of this display changes to become a more basic and less distracting display. It's also an awful lot dimmer. So at night, if you're on a country road, like out where I live in the country, that is really, really great because it really allows you to focus more on the road and then you can change it at the stroke of that dial. You can just pop things right back up there. The display goes back to normal. And then of course the infotainment system turns on. Moving over to the steering wheel, as you'd expect in a sport model, we have that red indicator right up top. We have metal paddle shifters on the back, down on the left, up over there on the right. On the right side, this is where we find track up down, volume up down, 
and then controls for that multifunction LCD. You then find the controls for the cruise control over here, heated steering wheel button right there, and then voice command and phone buttons. We then have this V button over here and then this interesting little toggle. The V mode button, as you'd expect, takes us in and out of the V mode, which is configurable via the infotainment system. I can just hit the edit button here and then I can change things like the steering, the suspension, the engine shifting, etc. If I press the V button again, it then goes back to the mode that the vehicle was in before. The other drive modes are accessed via this drive mode button here in the center console, and there are quite a lot of them. We have Tour, Sport, Track, Snow and Ice, My Mode, which is not the configurable V mode, that's actually a different configurable mode. And then if I press the V button, we get the V mode, which you can tell because we now get that little V icon there. The toggle on the right side of the steering wheel adjusts the performance traction options. This allows us to toggle between Race 1, Race 2, Sport, a dry mode, a wet mode, and then inactive, of course. When you get the CT4V Blackwing out on the road, you're really gonna notice the rear wheel drive nature. It was raining last night and it's about 33 degrees right now, so it's pretty cold and this does have summer tires on it. So I'm absolutely not going to be driving this that hard. The rear end definitely gets squirrely under hard acceleration, even though this has an E-limited slip differential in the rear, if the surfaces are less than perfect. If, however, the surfaces are perfect, like they were earlier in the week, then you can go 0-60 to 60 in 3.8 seconds in this model. That is definitely swift for this segment. It is a little bit below the Audi RS3. The RS3 is a little bit lighter, and that dual-clutch transmission shifts incredibly quickly. But 3.8 seconds in this vehicle was without launch control. Actually, to be honest, launch control and no launch control didn't really seem to affect the 0-60 to 60 time too much. It's always pretty quick but it's always going to be rear wheel drive. And that means that the personality of this is very different from the competition, which are all all wheel drive and front wheel drive biased in most situations. The RS3 can send a bit more power to the rear, and of course it has the torque vectoring axle in the rear, but no matter how you're driving the RS3, it's never going to be 100% rear wheel drive like this. So the experience is definitely going to be different. When it comes to stopping distance, I measured 106 feet from 60 miles an hour to zero. Definitely a very, very solid score. Keep in mind, we have 255 with tires up front, not 265s like we find in that RS5. As far as the exhaust note goes, I really like this V6 engine. And if you're looking for something that sounds different than the average four cylinder in this segment, you're gonna wanna take a look at this. Of course, there's also the RS5, which has that really cool five cylinder heartbeat. But if I had to choose, I have to admit I would be really torn and I don't know if I can make a choice actually come to think of it. So sorry about that. If my money were on the line, I don't know yet. Let me know what you think sounds better, this or the five cylinder engine that we find in the RS3. Either way, sounds better than the AMG Mercedes. When it comes to the handling score, clearly I have to give this an A+. It has a near perfect weight balance, wide grippy tires, and the rear wheel drive dynamics that so many enthusiasts are looking for. But it is a little bit heavier than the German competition. This model comes in about 3,850 pounds or so. That's about 200 pounds heavier than the Audi or the Mercedes. There are times where you will notice that, but I would actually say the bigger thing that you'll notice is the rear wheel drive nature of the vehicle and the perfect weight balance. In neutral handling situations, this isn't gonna plow in the corners like sometimes the Mercedes can. The Audi, that's a lot rarer because of the wider tires up front and the way that Audi has chosen to tune that vehicle, but it can still happen and it doesn't happen in this. I also think that Cadillac has tuned the steering perfectly. There's not as much feel from the front tires as I would like, but this is still very good for an electric power steering rack and that applies to all formats of the CT4, not just the Blackwing. Thanks to the weight and the size of the CT4 and of course the Magna Ride dampers, the ride quality is pretty decent out on a rougher road surface like the gravel road that I'm on now. This definitely comes across as more polished than the CLA 45, but it's still on the firm side of things. So if you're looking for something more comfortable, you might want to get the regular CT4V, not the Blackwing, or you can get the regular CT4 with the V engine in a slightly detuned format, 310 horsepower instead of 325. That's a pretty good deal if you don't want the extra sporty bits, but you do want a little bit more shove. Obviously, the suspension can get firmer. We can do that by the toggle down here or depending on the modes you've selected, that V button on the steering wheel. In this mode, the suspension is still definitely firm. Now, as you'd expect, you can firm things up quite a bit by putting this in its most aggressive suspension mode that's done by either the toggle there or the control on the steering wheel, depending on how your settings are adjusted. 
In its most aggressive mode, the suspension is definitely firm, but I appreciate the fact that it's not brittle like you find in some of the competition. This still has a solid feel, and even in that track mode, it handles speed bumps and potholes relatively well. That surprised me. I think that the ride quality comes in very, very similar to the Audi RS3, but in some situations, I think the RS3 is just a hair better for daily driving. This, however, is really, really well sorted, and I think it's better than the 2 Series and better than that AMG Mercedes as well. As far as the rest of the vehicle goes, I think that Cadillac has also done an incredible job. I love the LCD instrument cluster, I love the seating position, the view of the road, etc. It has a really solid feel to it. This is a very engaging car to drive, and again, it feels different than the others. Sometimes a bit more grown up, sometimes a little bit less so, because that rear end can get very, very lively. In fact, this may be another controversial statement, but the rear end of the CT4 is lively enough that I would really recommend getting the automatic transmission over the manual transmission. I was able to spend a little bit of time in a dealer-provided CT4 V Blackwing manual. Wow, that is a mouthful. And on slicker roads especially, the rear end can get broken loose a little bit more because generally traction stability control can't control the motion of a manual transmission vehicle as well. If this had all-wheel drive, then I would want the manual transmission, but as it is, I think I would get the automatic. The automatic is also going to be faster. The fastest recorded times with professional drivers and the manual transmission in this vehicle are just around 4 to 4.1 seconds. Most folks out there are probably going to get 0 to 16 in about 4.5 to 5 seconds, depending on exactly how much you want to roast your clutch. The automatic is generally going to get everybody 0 to 60 faster, and it's a really well done automatic transmission. The shifts are fast, we can put it in the manual mode if we want to, and you know, then really watch out on slick roads like we're on here. Not only is it wet, but it's also covered with leaves, but you can still have an awful lot of fun. And then of course there's that exhaust note. Now interestingly, when I just put this in the regular mode, it is surprisingly quiet for this group of cars. So. 70.5 decibels in here at 50 miles an hour makes this a little bit quieter than most of the competition and really right in line with the next category up. Also kind of in line with the next category up is fuel economy, but that's not a good thing. I averaged 17 miles per gallon over a week of mixed driving in this vehicle. That is not especially good compared to the all-wheel drive competition. Those will get you further on a gallon of gasoline. After a week behind the wheel of this caddy, I'm going to be really sad to see it go, but not quite as sad as I was to see the RS3 go. And some of that is just down to the personality. This is more fun, but the fun requires a lot more patience, a lot more attention, and more skill, to be perfectly frank. The RS3 is the kind of vehicle you can just point a direction, floor it, and it just sorts everything out, goes exactly where you want it to go. This requires more skill. This is not the kind of vehicle you can just crank the wheel, floor it. If I did that, I would be over the edge, and this story would not end well. The RS3 is a different kind of beast, but in some ways it's not as fun because it doesn't require that level of skill, because it can't do the things that the CT4 V Blackwing can do. It comes across as perhaps a little bit more video game-like, but for a daily driver where you want to be able to have fun all the time, I think that's a slightly better mix of personality. Let me know what you think down there, and now let's move on to pricing. As you can see on the competitive pricing chart, the Blackwing is much more in line with the RS3 and the CLA45 than the next category up in price tag. Size is again a little bit tricky here. Starting at $60,495, it starts right in the same price range as the RS3. And comparably priced, it is really less expensive than the CLA45. The important thing to keep in mind is that this is 2022 pricing for the CLA, and a lot of options are optional on the CLA, and you get more standard equipment on the Cadillac. With the exception, of course, of the automatic transmission. Now, some folks will actually like that, some might not. The manual transmission is standard. And then, of course, there's all-wheel drive, which is not available at all on the Blackwing. But again, that can be a feature, not a bug for some folks out there. As far as top-end price goes, the Blackwing does get as expensive as a CLA 45, but that's through some of the optional carbon fiber trim packages, which honestly I would skip. They actually add weight and I don't think they look as good as making the CT4 a little bit more discreet, but that's just me. Anyway, you slice it, however, it is significantly less expensive than a BMW M3. And again, this sort of makes sense because performance-wise, the Blackwing is not where the M3 is. And of course, the M3 competition, the most powerful, fastest version, etc., that's actually going to be all-wheel drive. That's going to be the one all the way up there to $112,000 fully loaded. So you can see that the Blackwing is definitely in a different price category. 
And that's why bottom lining the black wing is pretty easy for me at the moment. It is tons of fun, but in a different way from the RS3 and the CLA45. I would say it comes a close second to the RS3 for me in this itty bitty sized category. There's no BMW entry really here after all. So that would put the RS3 at the top, the Blackwing second, and the CLA 45 third. For me, some of this comes down to the ease of driving the RS3. And theoretically, the whole point of this category is an affordable, quote unquote, performance vehicle. So the RS3, the CLA, etc., you can theoretically get versions of them and the CT4 as well, of course, under $50,000. So as a step up from something like uh, the most expensive Camry, for instance, you could theoretically get into some of the base versions of these vehicles. And this is designed for that person that wants to daily drive. So they're commuting in the car, they're maybe doing track day stuff on the weekend, maybe they're autocrossing, etc. That's the entire purpose of this category. So it's important that the vehicle be really well-rounded, both for daily driving and for those fun activities. And I think the RS3 is just slightly better at that. I like the suspension tune a bit more. I love the all-wheel drive nature of it. But as I said, it feels perhaps a little bit video game-like at some point when you're driving the vehicle because it is is so good at handling. You just floor it, you point it in a direction, and it absolutely goes there with no drama, no fuss, no muss, especially when the winter weather is happening. And we don't get a lot of snow where I live, but we do get rain, and that was really obvious with the Blackwing. Now, if you're after rear-wheel drive dynamics, there is absolutely no substitute. I also think that the CT4 does actually quite well when it comes to interior refinement. There are some cheap parts inside the RS3 and the CLA. It's just the way inexpensive vehicles like this work. Remember that by the time you've gone from the base CLA all the way up to the most expensive model, you've more than doubled its price tag. It goes from around thirty-five dollars to $38,000 down there at the bottom, all the way over $80,000. So for $80,000, there are definitely parts and pieces in the CLA interior that don't feel that premium. And of course, same thing goes for the Audi as well. I think in this realm, the Cadillac actually does a bit better. Now to get there, you do have to check a few option boxes. So if you don't check the option box, for instance, for the microfiber suede headliner or the microfiber seat backs, then you do get less premium materials there. But I think on average, the interior is done really well. Also a factor for some folks, maintenance and reliability is probably going to be better on the Cadillac than the RS3 or the CLA45. The dual clutch transmissions require a different maintenance schedule, definitely more maintenance there. And then of course the advanced all wheel drive systems as well. All of that put together kind of breeds unreliability and higher maintenance costs. Everything is probably going to be less expensive on the Cadillac. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section. And would you buy the Caddy because of its more pure driving dynamics? Or would you get arguably the more video game like RS3 because it is just absolutely bonkers fantastic? It will seriously change your mind if you're the kind of person that thinks that front wheel drive biased vehicles or transverse engine vehicles just can't compete. I encourage you, I challenge you, drive these two vehicles back to back, see which one you like more, and I think the RS3 will really surprise you. But then again, so will the Cadillac. And if I were going to choose between a BMW M3 and the Caddy, I would probably choose the CT4, if nothing else, because it's going to be $20,000 less expensive. Um, you know, it's not going to perform quite the same, but I think that it is going to be good enough that you might really challenge your perceptions there about Cadillac as well. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section. Find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course, I'll see all of you next week.